Welcome to the Nines presented by at and I'm Monte Cristo, joined here once again for a nice conversation with the owner of Cloud9. Well, one of many owners, the, the primary owner, let's say, <laughs> Jack Etienne. Uh, we were going to talk with some players today, but now there have been so, so many changes to the Cloud9 organization. Thought it would be best just to uh, have you explain what is going on with the League of Legends roster currently, because it's been... Um, I would say a, a pretty huge off season for you guys in terms of movement. Uh, where did you, let's start with, for those of you who don't know, I, I assume if you're watching on the cloud nine channel, you're probably aware of what's going on, but the announced players that we've, we've had for cloud nine so far are summit, very famous Korean player in the top line, top lane. I said line. Cause I'm in Korea right now. And that's what they would call it. <laughs> uh, blabber uh, who is returning to the jungle role fudge who is, role swapping from top to mid lane and then you are keeping zven but also adding a korean uh up and coming adc named berserker you are bringing isles in uh who is an australian player from your academy team and also winsome who is another korean player but who has u.s citizenship so he doesn't count as an import did i get all of that right you absolutely correct. This, and this is like, this is historic for Cloud9. We've actually never had this many changes in an off season, having um, four of the positions have new faces in them. That's, yep. that's completely new. And um, this, and, and even into our academy team, we've got a lot of changes and a lot of new faces. This is going to be a huge project for us to, to, to work on. And thankfully the, you know, the signature part is done. We've got, you know, all, you know, it's actually 11 of our players signed. Um, uh, so now the hard part is coming into is, hey, could we actually make this team function? <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that seems like the core part of it. So let's talk about, um, you know, there's there's just so much to talk about here because you guys had a, a quite honestly, a very good success at Worlds this year. Um, you made it out of groups, which NA hasn't done since you guys did it last, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, off the top of my head, <laughs> several years ago. Um, and so you got perks, which is obviously a huge signing, uh, during the off season. And so what were the factors that went into these decisions? Because you would think that with your success, you might've wanted to run it back, but what were some of the issues that you, that you found with the team that you thought required these changes? Oh man, it's a long, it's literally a long story because this, the, the rebuilding of this roster started while we were still like. I think I first kind of got wind of it around the play-in stage um, mm. and somewhere between the play-in stage and the first round Robin of group stage um, perks told me that uh, for family reasons that he wasn't going to be returning to, to LCS next year. Um, so I started building this roster and um, it went through many, many different iterations. And um, uh, you know, one of the things that happens at worlds is you know, you, you finish worlds and we already knew that perks was going to be swapping out and we had, a, we had to have a really good world. So if you look back, like, you know, objectively on, on the season, it was actually a really good season, but winning spring, getting to yeah. MSI, beating Damwon, beating energy, uh, energy, um, uh, RNG, um, uh, getting to worlds, getting out of groups. I mean, this is, this is a really good year. Um, so yep. making these changes were definitely not something you would would, would hope to happen, but sometimes it's required. And especially when a centerpiece of your team is leaving, you need to really rethink what you're doing. Um, and then standard practice after worlds, you need to sit down with your players and you talk about, you know, what is it you want to do with your career? Do you like, you know, what did you like here? What did you want to change? And there are some, you know, there are some things we need to figure out, you know, some players really wanted to go in a different direction than what we were looking to do. And we may have tried to like pursue that direction originally, um, you know, as we try to figure out which mid we're going to play with, some players really wanted, you know, say Bjergsen, some other, you know, nemesis. So we had to figure this, these things out. And as pieces either became unavailable or unavailable, we had to switch up our roster configuration to where we are today. Um, and, you know, especially with uh, the way that like LCK uh, players become available, it's much later in the year, uh, basically free agency day is often when you first find out about what players are available, that that definitely layered in a lot of other changes where 
uh, on free agency day and before free agency day started, we really thought our team was going to go one direction. And then when Summit became available and Berserker became available, we were talking to Teddy, we were talking to Kana, like all these amazing players became available. Like, again, it was like basically all our plans right out the window. What are we going to build now? And so it was, it was a, it was a long, um, arduous, fun process. <laughs> well, yeah. And a, a player like Summit is you know, obviously one of the top uh, top laners in the world right now uh, has had a you know a pretty solid career so far. Um, when did the when did you can start considering the option of switching uh, Fudge from top lane to mid? Uh, because that that's was it because Summit became available that you decided to make that, or was Fudge saying I want to play mid lane um, before hmm. that happened? So were you looking for top laners? Or were you looking for mid laners? And how did those yeah. dominoes fall? If that, I'm just trying to think back. Yes, I was <laughs> definitely sleep deprived. Those memories are a little foggy, but I remember we were like deep into talks with other mid lane options. And, and I remember getting a message by Max and, and he's like, Jack, really huge, huge. We got to talk about some interesting ideas. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And I drive into the office and, and Fudge and Max are like, what about Fudge goes mid lane and we talk to Kana who may be available. It looks like he's going to be leaving T1. And my mind was like, what? Are you kidding me? Oh, and by the way, Teddy might also be available. So that like um, basically hit the reset button on everything I was, I was thinking. I'm like, this is crazy, but I think it might actually work. Um, Fudge, you know, in scrims and in some games uh, over the last year had swapped mid with perks like several times and he played yep. extremely well. Um, and when he was on our Academy team, him and Palafox would swap whenever it was like a best fit. So we knew he could do it. Um, uh, so, and it was really like a product of, Hey, there's some really incredible top lane talent available. And there's really wasn't the mid lanes that we were looking for, weren't going to be coming to us. So it just seems like for us, like we want to build the best team. We know Fudge could do it. We saw how much he grew this year in top lane. We know he can do mid. So let's let's build the strongest team possible with the available pieces that are, are coming up. And so we started, you know, going after Akana. Um, we also were considering. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but I always give him a Zeus. I think he goes sold something else in, in, in Korea. Um, <laughs> it's but it's 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 Zeus. It would be Zeus, and in if you directly translated it into like. Korean phonetics, but yeah, I mean, it's Zeus. Yes, <laughs> that's how that's, yeah, I knew, I knew I was saying it wrong, but like, you know, these players, um, they're incredible. And we're like, okay, let's like, let's think about this. And then as we were going through that process, we're like, okay, let's think about every top laner that could actually fit this. And then when we thought about summit, we're like, whoa, that guy's incredible. Like he's so good. Mm -hmm. And Fudge is like, that guy He's like, raise his hands. Like this guy's way better than me at top lane. He should be <laughs> top lane. Let me go to mid. Um, and, uh, you know, so we started talking with him. He was, I, frankly, I gotta be honest. Like I was surprised he actually was really down to come to North America. Um, but he, he's like, I love LA. I've been to LA. I like it. I want to do this. This is a challenge that like I would love to do. I'm like, you serious? Like get over here, man. <laughs> and, um, and I would, it was, it was similar with, with Berserker as well. Like he, he, he was up for the challenge. And we were a little nervous because we, you know, we hadn't seen, we'd seen like VODs of him, but we hadn't seen like point of view VODs. So we actually had him uh, hop onto Discord and stream some of his like, solo queue games just so we could watch yep. the way he like, you know, his mouse movement and, and um, just, we watched, I think like three games and like me and Fudge and Max were like, oh my God, this guy's, this guy's incredible. He's like legit. He actually, uh, we need to go after this guy. And uh, so we picked him up. Um, and of course, like um, we had to see how this was going to fit in with with the other pieces that we had. Uh, and uh, so that was that was like the next struggle. Once we bought once we knew these guys are coming in, like, how's the rest of our team going to, uh, you know, feel about this? And one of the things we really felt would be important is that we have an academy team that was super strong that we could actually have internal scrims and they would be useful and valuable. And so part of our process in soft season was to build a very strong academy team. 
So let's talk about the Academy roster then. So have you, have you already decided on the starters? Because, uh, you know, I, I, you guys haven't done any kind of scrims yet. Some of the players are still in Korea. Some of the players are are in North America. So what's the process for deciding starters? Because you have a great player like Zven or, you know, King was, was running in the LCS um, mm-hmm. at times last year. So how are you going to structure the difference or, or how have you, let's start with, have you decided on the starters? At first off, or is that going to be decided via boot camp? Um, mm-hmm. And what are you going to be doing with the the academy roster? So the, the starters for lock in tournament on January fourteenth will be determined through our boot camp in Korea. Now we yeah. have like place tags, like like you know we have these placeholders like right now for them, but those those roles will be changed by what we see in our Korea boot camp. Um, right now, though, like our placeholders um, is is Summit, Blabber, Fudge, Berserker, and Isles being starting LCS. And then our Academy, which people don't know about, um, is Darshan. This will be new. Malice. Copy is returning. Yeah. Zven has agreed to to join on the Academy team um, and uh, win some. And then we also have uh, an 11th player, uh, King, decided that he was so interested and intrigued in the project that we're building um, that he wanted to be a part of it. And why would he be intrigued? Like we, we're we guaranteeing a minimum of five games uh, with our academy team every single week. We're looking to do actually more. Plus, on top of that, we're looking to have like our own internal um like solo queue, I guess you would say. After the day is done, we're gonna we're gonna look to have um, not only our eleven players, but some of our coaches are all our challenge. We have sure. two, three challenger ranked um, coaches that are part of our staff that will be playing as well, and we're gonna look to have a lot of uh, experiment a lot uh, after scrim hours. And uh, uh, as a as a quick aside, Riot announced that they're going to be doing a separate uh, like West Coast in-house uh, like queue for professional players and yeah. also for players that they deem, I don't know, worthy. Who knows how that's going to work? They haven't announced any details. Yeah. Um, are, you, are you excited about this in addition to your own kind of in-house solo queue experimentation? Yeah, I'm, I'm high hopes that that is going to work. I mean, I'm a little worried that the implementation won't go smoothly, but uh, if it works the way we all hope it will work, I think it will definitely make um, uh, the after hours work that players put in much more enjoyable and much more productive if it actually works. But you know, if in case it doesn't, we're planning to have a, our own internal backups. So what, it, uh, as far as who is going to be the starter, what was the decision, especially between Isles and Winsome? Because Winsome's coming in as a, kind of uh, am- like amateur level support player. He's never played in LCK before. And Isles is is an up and coming player as well. So what made you at least do the placeholder positions with Isles on the main roster as opposed to Winsome? Um, I think with Winsome, um, we just didn't have enough time with him yet to really assign him uh, like an LCS spot compared to Isles, where we felt really positive about uh, the work he's put in with us and the year he's been with us. And we know, we know he, there's no guesswork about what he's going to bring. Um, and so we knew we were going to go with him. Um, Berserker, we had more information on what we were getting out of him. Uh, and also part of him coming out here, he wanted to be automatically assigned to the LCS spot. So that would be agreed to do that. Got it. Um, and so, but, that's conditional based on performance, right? Because it seems Always. like you're you're yeah. you're you're creating a highly competitive environment when it comes to like having a player of Sven's caliber on the academy team is quite the challenge to keep your yeah. spot uh, yeah. on the main roster. Yeah, and for for you know for for Sven to want to do this, he wanted to see that the academy team was very strong, and he wanted to see that he had a real opportunity to get the spot back on LCS. So it's very important that he has a fair shot that the better player wins, and that's what we're going to be looking for. It's always the 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 strongest team that we can put together for a stage is the team that's going to be playing. One thing that I love about Sven is that he is like a true competitor and he always values competition and pushing himself. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he has an incredible drive. And I mean, 
he said it on on the last episode of Summoning Insight that we had him on, but also, you know, privately to me, he also said, uh, so I knew it wasn't bullshit, uh, that he really valued actually the experience on the Academy team yeah. last year and that he felt it it helped him grow in a lot of ways. And so he wasn't, I've never heard him be like frustrated by that, by yeah. that experience at all. It was, I mean, it, it was, it showed so much character that when he was benched, the first thing he wanted to do is like, how do I win my spot back? And he didn't cry about it. He's like, I just need to get better. I need to be a better teammate. I recognize my issues. Yep. So literally like the day he, the day he got benched, he just wanted to know like, okay, when do we start tomorrow? Like literally he's like, what time do I <laughs> yeah. start tomorrow? I'll be at workout tomorrow. And I think all of his teammates, like on the LCS team, their jaws hit the ground. They didn't really expect most players would probably just pack it up and go home but yeah, he's a, he's very professional he always yeah he showed up he worked out super hard he immediately just like turned that team on the academy like you know into a better place and they were they were they were doing much better he and when he left he left the academy team in a better position than when he he showed up and when he returned back to the team he had made massive improvements on the things he wanted to focus on and improve on um, which were mostly around um, just being a better teammate. So some of the other changes that happened, obviously you alluded to it, perks for for personal reasons, wanting to go back to mm -hmm. to Europe. Um, and you know the other player that you that you're not going to continue forward with is Vulcan, who is now with EG. So right. uh, Vulcan, I would say, had probably a pretty rough worlds overall, even though he's been very consistent over the year. He mm -hmm. seemed. Um, at times not to be on the same page in terms of like comp execution as some of the other, uh, as the rest of the team, uh, on C9, uh, was, did you feel this was a, a temporary thing or why, why did you make the decision to, to let Vulcan go to, to EG? I mean, he's, he's still an incredible player and, um, ultimately he, he was in his decision to want to move on. Um, mm. he, he, uh, my personal thought is that I think that not having duo queue for him and Jesper was really was really damaging for the way they learned best together. I don't think that they're the type of guys that, who want to sit down after practice and review VOD and, and discuss how to get better. They, they both want to grind out a ton of games and figure out through experience, through duo queue, what works best for them. And that not being here for this last year was really damaging to their ability to play at the top of their game. So I really hope Riot does bring it back at some point because I think it was really hard for those type of people. Um, and um, I think him and Jesper struggled to connect all year the way they had in 2020. And he really wanted to, to change things up. Um, and when there was a time through our roster building phase that he he didn't want to run it back um, with that bot lane. And mm. it looked like that was going to be our only option. And so he was like, hey, you know, I, you know, I love being here. I love Cloud9. Um, but if that's what you guys are looking to do, I, I think I want to try something new. Um, mm. It was really respectful. And uh, I think I think it's really good that someone like recognizes it's time for a change. And they're really upfront about it. And so we worked really hard to find him the best team to go to. And I think I think the team that EG is building is scary as hell. I, I frankly, like if I look at all the other rosters out there, <laughs> I think they're the the EG is gonna be one of the toughest teams out there. Obviously, is gonna be strong because they're running it back, but I think EG has something is building something pretty, pretty damn good. Not as good as us, but pretty damn good. <laughs> yeah, not worried about TL at all. I mean, it, it seems interesting that they're I mean, they've announced this like, super a, roster. They've got, I mean, it, it is a super roster, right? It, like on paper, it looks incredible. I've seen a lot of super teams not work out. Um, so th I feel yeah. like they've got so much pressure on them. And if they stumble at all, I think it's going to be really hard to overcome that pressure from, uh, and so, uh, and it, obviously they could be incredible, but I think it could also, also not work and really explode. So I'll be really interested to see how, how that plays out. Yeah, I, I do think that at least uh, having Giotto come in as the head coach, considering he's such a good, like, 
player personality and mm. emotion manager is, mm -hmm. is a positive sign for them. Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with that for sure. I think that's, the, I think it's going to be really important for uh, team atmosphere to have a guy like that on board. So that's a good pick I, I do, I do share some of your, your skepticism, however, when it comes yeah. to the personalities on that team and, you know, you're, you're taking a, I, I would say C9 is taking a very different approach with this, where you are bringing in some, uh, players that haven't played at least in their peak regional leagues before, like Winsome or, or like Berserker. And then you're coupling them with some newer players uh, like Fudge is only his second year after all. And it'll be his mm -hmm. first year in the mid lane. And then, a, you know, veteran, more veteran players now like Blabber and, and Summit who have been playing for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, I I think our edge is going to be I think we have this like by far the smartest coaches in, in the LCS, uh, if not the entire West. And so um, I believe that we will be able to get better faster than any of the other teams in the LCS. So you haven't actually, which coaches can you talk about right now? Because you haven't announced a yeah. head, head coach for the LCS team. So what is the current coaching situation? Who are you keeping from last year? With, uh, without an announcement of a head coach, I still think we have, like if we didn't have a head coach, <laughs> we would still have the best coaching staff in the LCS it. with Max and Vigar. <laughs> Uh, those guys are absolutely brilliant coaches. Um, they're, um, they look at the game in a way that no other coach I've ever seen has. Um, and they can really get in there and challenge the players to, to, um, reevaluate their view on how to play the game and look for incremental improvements, um, that will be tracked. And through that progression, those players will get better. And I, and it's not, I'm just not saying it. I literally Max did it. You know, he did it with Fudge all year long. Uh, Viger has did it with various players on our team, like all year long. Viger has a long history of doing this. In fact, he was the coach for Bjergsen uh, in 2020, where we saw Bjergsen play some of his best in summer um, of 2020. And, and he attributes a lot to it, to, to Viger. I can say that when I was talking with Bjergsen, he straight up said that like our coaching staff is top notch and he would love to work with some of these people. Uh, so um, even before we talk about the head coach, um, our, our, our coaching staff is just lights out and it's going to get better. And I can't wait to talk about that later. <laughs> not today, guys, not today. You're, not today. you're hyped up, but it will, it will happen. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so any, any updates on the Academy coaching staff at all? Uh, so, yeah, this is actually cool. Um, our, Amateur coach Tails has been promoted to our academy head coach, and um, you know uh, Max spent a lot of time on evaluating coach options and spent some time with with Tails. Just thought like, wow, this guy um, not only like uh, on his own has really pushed his players to improve, but I think given a little bit of direction can really. Uh, in, in, improve our academy coaching situation. So we're really excited to promote from within to bring on tails to that, to that uh, academy head coach position. Awesome. Uh, so let's talk about the fudge swap uh, real quick, because we actually do have some stats from the stat hub powered by Microsoft to talk about his solo queue games, because we don't have anything to go on right now. So this is, <laughs> these are his November solo queue games for, uh, comparing to his top lane games. And as you mm. can see right now, you know, it's just solo queue. So don't read into it too much, but a little bit, but it's cool. We can have this comparison looking at his KDA, a little bit higher DPM in the top lane, uh, which is going to be on the left-hand side, which, you know, you might expect uh, given his comfort with that position. Been playing a lot of Zoe, apparently. So interesting choice <laughs> of a kind of a first champion in solo queue to main uh, and his KDA matching up there with Zoe to his overall KDA, uh, you know, for, for all of his games that he's played. So 18 games of Zoe across 48. So how has, let's use this to talk about how has Fudge been preparing for this mid lane transition and how is this great coaching staff that you're talking about who has coached, you know, Bjergsen positionally, who has helped out some of these other mid lane players. Um, how are they evaluating and coaching him through this solo queue experience right now? I mean, um, the, those spe specifics on that are best answered by the coaches, but what I can say from what I'm seeing is that every day I'm seeing Fudge grinding on these champions and 
frankly, he's having a blast. He is, you know, I hear him talking. I definitely for several days heard him talking about Zoe and how much fun he's having with that champion, how cool he thought <laughs> it was. Um, uh, and so um, he, he's spending a ton of time digging into the champions that he really didn't, you know, hasn't really spent or saw in, in top lane. And that, um, and Max and other coaching people um, have really been watching these games with him, talking about how he's, uh, you know, how he's, how he's basically using the champion and its abilities and what, and, and uh, he's, you know, he's absolutely having a, an absolute grand time, like just jumping into this new role. And it's really fun. I mean, he's always really passionate uh, about the game, but there's definitely a new level of curiosity and wonder and excitement that I see out of him. It feels <laughs> like a, it's like a kid at Christmas. He's like ripping up over these, like all these gifts and having a really good time. So I know, um, I know he's super passionate about it. And, um, you know, you don't see that out of players that have generally been playing this long. Um, uh, and so he's going to become. Well, he's only 19, right? Uh, I know he's still a kid. <laughs> he really is a kid opening up like presents. But like, yeah, he is so excited about it. And so um, uh, I fear uh, for what he's going to do to the other Midlands in North America. I think he's going to definitely uh, smash them. Yeah, one of the reasons I'm I'm confident about about this swap for him is, like you said, he he, he played some, although limited, like good mid game, uh, mid lane uh, games during during your as a professional player mm -hmm. when he was swapping with perks, as you said, but also because I watched a bunch of his games in academy uh, last year before he came onto mm -hmm. the roster, and he was you know clearly very good even at that time, mm -hmm. and I know is from talking to him his personal passion for the game as well as I think being young and being making the swap helps a lot, but yeah. obviously very mechanically talented, very driven. Um, and he learned quickly. I mean, we saw that last mm -hmm. year, he, his lock-in tournament was a little shaky, but by the time MSI rolled around, he had the best international performance on the team after his yeah. rookie split, which I think says a lot about his nerves. Right. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah, absolutely zero fear, uh, which is, uh, it's a rare quality. Um, uh, and I think like people really haven't talked about like what the fudge blabber synergy is going to be like, because, um, both of them are like very cerebral, cerebral, smart, like interactive players. And they are spending so much time talking about the game, uh, in a way that I've rarely seen, um, jungle mids like duos do. Uh, and it's, it's not all about like this cracking jokes and having fun. That it's not that type of synergy. They're actually talking about the game and how the champions will work together. And I think that if they're able to keep that curiosity and drive, they're going to be bringing some really new stuff to LCS. Well, thanks Microsoft for the stats on the solo queue. We'll dive into more stats once we actually have professional game matches available when the next lock-in tournament starts. And going back to uh, your, your comments on synergy, yeah, I think one of the things that was very noticeable uh, last year was that Perks and, and Blabber never really managed to get a high level of synergy. Um, mm -hmm. It felt like when you guys were playing. Um, how, do you, how do you think that this mid-jungle relationship is different than the last one that you had? Um, I, I think because Fudge is really still trying to figure out the role, um, it it allows him to really ask the like some of the simple basic interactive questions that maybe perks and blabber never really got into because they're both like professionals been doing this for a while um and i think that's going to really build their relationship on on how they want to play the game together versus just kind of like play the way they always play and see if it fits and um i i did see like over the course of the year that that uh Perks and Blabber did synergize better, but it, I don't think it was ever at the level that um, maybe like we, that we saw out of spring 2020 between Niski and, and Blabber. They're really was right. much stronger yeah, yeah, in like yeah, half of sure. summer. Um, and I do expect to see that out of out of Fudge Blabber because the communication that they that they do have is, is um, much more direct and meaningful um, and versus just playing around. Well, like you say, I think it's probably helpful, too, that because Fudge is coming into this position new, um, he can, as he's forming his style, he can form it to synergize with Blabber as opposed to Perks, who definitely already had a very, you know, successful and, and uh, you know, kind of set style that he wanted to mm -hmm. play and, and had been, you know, a many-time champion on before. It makes it harder mm -hmm. to change. 
Mm -hmm. and, and I think also, you know, these guys, um, you know, although it's a new role for Fudge, they've got a pretty long relationship, working like working relationship. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of trust there. And um, so this is going to be like the second year playing on the same team, but the third year being around each other. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they've got this base relationship already uh, that I think is going to be really useful uh, in the, the days to come. So let's talk about, uh, well, actually, let's do a Puma giveaway first. Uh, oh, yeah. Because... <laughs> got to do the hashtag Puma. So if you guys are in Twitch chat, go ahead and hit hashtag Puma. Uh, you have to be 18 years or older and living in North America. If you would like to win a gift card for Puma, we will have the mods announce that a little bit later. But we're going to get all the spamming out of the way because we'll do some Q&A from Twitch chat with Jack later because I'm sure you guys have questions of your own. So let's talk about now that we talked about all of the many offseason changes that you've made. Uh, let's talk about the future of what you guys are going to be doing. So what is the plan in the coming weeks for getting this roster all synergized? Obviously, some players are in Korea, where where I am right now. Uh, some of your players, I imagine, kind of went back home, uh, mm -hmm. either to Europe or North America. So what is your your plan for practice and synergy because you guys didn't get a Korean boot camp due to the pandemic yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, but that ha I know that's been really core to Cloud Nine's kind of preparation. Previously, you guys like to prep longer and harder in Korea than any of the other LCS teams. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know. Do you still have your facility here? Because I know in the past, yeah, you did, but... <laughs> I, I, that's a good question right there. So we, you know, uh, when on the onset of COVID um, was the time for us to re up our our facility in Korea and we decided to to not because we really didn't know mm -hmm. what was going on with the world and we couldn't get out there. Um, so everything we're doing obviously has a lens of the COVID lens of how we get in and out of countries, but we've spent a lot of time in this off season trying to figure out the smoothest way to get all of our players out to Korea. And we're looking to do that within a week. Um, uh, we, we plan to have every player so all 11 of our players in korea all our coaching staff um at early in december end of november um and the idea is we're going to scrim um uh until around december you know 23rd 24th uh then officially it would be a vacation um from the 24th until about the second uh, anyone who wants to stay in Korea will support you guys to stay out there in Korea. Um, um, otherwise, we're going to see everybody in NA for a continuation of our of our boot camp, getting ready for lock in. Um, so, um, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of like a uh, a lot of uh, issues just getting people out there. So there might be some problems along the way, but we think we we have a pretty good path to to getting getting out there, everyone out there safely. Um, as far as the facility is concerned, though, uh, we are going to be um, leasing another facility out there so that for in the future, not only we're we going to be setting that up uh, in this offseason, um, we're going to have it available for our players to go in between every split again. So, um, you know, if for some reason we, you know, we don't go to MSI this next year, then the guys would go like immediately to Korea to start preparing for summer. Um, between summer, uh, if we qualified it for Worlds, uh, between summer uh, and Worlds, we would go out to Korea again uh, for a proper boot camp. Um, and it's kind of crazy because Worlds would be here in North America. But the reality is if we stay here, uh, if you qualify for Worlds, you won't have you won't Practice. be in good enough shape to play the Eastern yeah. teams. Uh, so you <laughs> need they'll, to, they'll, they'll stay there. They'll stay, they'll there stay there the and minute. they will stay there to the yeah. last possible minute. Yep. And so we'll just go out there, get adjusted to the time, probably scrim for three weeks and then come right back and get adjusted to the time again. But this is, you know, it sounds crazy, but that's how, that's how it used to always be. Um, the, yep. the last two years of not doing that is actually unusual. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited to have a cloud nine facility back in Korea because um, it's something like every time, as soon as we're not actually playing competitively, as soon as our seasons are over, our players are like, hey, can I get out to Korea? I need to get out there because um, the experience of, of solo queue is so much better. Like the queue, the, the, the queue times are, are, are faster. The games go faster because you generally, if the game is one-sided that, you know, one side FS really quick. Um, and you can get in like 
three times to four times the number of games in a day uh, in Korea with a higher level of play. So you just learn paying. much and lower pay. You just learn so <laughs> much faster. So um, yeah, we're very excited to be able to have that again. Yeah, I remember um, when when Sven and Vulcan were first uh, getting their duo synergy together. They came mm-hmm. out early uh, to mm-hmm. Korea at the end of at the end of what 2019. Um, right and after then Thanksgiving, played, like yeah, we, played we hundreds of games and then like, let me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember they went like uh, you know a month before the rest of the team came or several mm-hmm. weeks and just worked on their synergy in solo queue and they they loved it. They loved yeah. it. Yeah. It was wild. They, yeah, they flew out. They were there. They're in Korea for a month, went home for Christmas, turned around, came back to Korea again, a boot camp for three weeks, then came back to, to North America for uh, the, the launch of spring. And we were in incredible shape. We absolutely just dominated. It was, um, it definitely helped us. Yeah. And I think that was a huge part of the reason that you guys had mm-hmm. so much success in the spring split of, of 2020 was, you know, coming strong in strong off of the, off of the boot camp. Yes, no doubt about it. It's really it's a key part to our preparation. So let's let's talk about some of the the LCS changes that have been made, as well as some of the things that are set, staying the same. You mm. did reference the lock in tournament. Yeah. Now, um, how do you view the lock in tournament? Because for me, it's kind of like the Kespa Cup in Korea, which is like the meta is not set yet. We're seeing the first professional games on the the big sweeping changes that Riot makes every season. Um, do you, do you care about this or do you more view it as an opportunity to get experience, build synergy, uh, for the LCS proper? Um, so there's a few different answers there. Like from the fan perspective, I think it's really fun. Um, oh yeah, for, for sure. The I like broadcast it. for the broad, yeah. Cause you get to see these new, new teams right away and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're good. Some of them are going to be super sloppy, so it's fun. And the meta is God knows what the hell is going on, especially this next year. It's going to be interesting. Um, and I think for the broadcast, it's really it's really valuable because if you only had like summer split to base like your narratives and stories off of, that's a pretty bad place because a lot of teams get ripped apart and it won't really apply anymore. So they're going to be able to build narratives off of, off of something current for us going into winter, or excuse me, into uh, spring. Um, and then for us, like especially for a team that literally has four new people in roles, it's cr- it's critical. It's like crucial. We we need those games to to be able to look and see because we're going to come in with an idea of what we think is good. We're going to come with an idea of like how how people are playing, and then we're going to go out there. We're going to find out there's a lot of holes in what we think is right and what was wrong, and we're going to have to adjust. And the lock in tournament gives us the ability to to test things out, see how it's going, and then be ready for for actual start of spring. So. Um, I, I absolutely love the locket tournament. I think it's a really great change to what we've been doing. Would you have been as confident making this many changes if the lock-in tournament didn't exist? Uh, I, I'm just I curious how still much of a, have the done format it. has like changed I, your GMing process. So. Okay, I still would have done it. But it was, it would have definitely been a little more scary because I would have less time to make adjustments if things weren't working. So it definitely gives me confidence to know, like, if things just like we we hop on stage and it's just absolutely terrible and um, the worst thing we've ever seen and it's a total <laughs> it's a total tragedy, we could actually okay, you know, fudge, you're going back up top, copy, we're promoting <laughs> you, like you know, this man getting here. Summit's a mid laner now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- actually, seriously, he's actually probably a really good option, like. We could, we could, you know, the worst case scenario, we could, you could make huge adjustments and be prepared. Um, so, but if we didn't have lock in, I would have still done the same. I still would have done the same moves. I would have had just less assurances to fix it if things went wrong. Uh, some of some of the other changes that happened is that they've gotten rid of the uh, cumulative schedule. Yeah. So, uh, which. I think is welcome. I think it's very difficult to have in esports to have those kind of year long mm. results uh, just because the patches change, the meta changes. And so, you know, things that were relevant in, in the early part of spring, having those count towards who goes to worlds a, in late summer, you know, who could be good at that time might be completely different based on the meta. So I think it's difficult mm. to justify in esports those kind of like long term uh, results. Um, and then the other change is that they're they're going back down to two 
best of ones a week in the summer instead of the or a double round robin instead of a triple round robin like they had before, which I think is also welcome because many of the players were complaining that going in for an extra day uh, basically eliminated a day of scrims just to play one game on stage. And they didn't feel it was a great use of their time or, or it was hurting their ability to be good at the game, basically. Um, yeah, uh, uh, on both parts. Absolutely. The extra day of of broadcast um for just one game each team really did hurt like our the average weekly solo queue numbers or excuse uh, average weekly scrim numbers dropped down tremendously like did we had teams that were just like literally just doing 15 like uh scrim games going into each week and week over week you could see teams were not improving um the way they should have been uh, and what we started seeing is that teams started doing night blocks so like Tuesday, Thursday night blocks, and the players were just exhausted. It, it, it was really um, having a negative impact on 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 the players and uh, our staff members. Just felt like a total drag. Add that to the cumulative, the cumulative like uh, scoring um, and records passing over. It just it felt like an extremely long year. Um, and I think for the teams on the top, it wasn't so painful having that cumulative score, but for any teams on like the bottom half, I think it really started feeling hopeless for those guys that they could yeah. actually, uh, you know, you could make, you could have a completely different team in summer, uh, but dragging that score across just made it yeah. feel hopeless for those guys. So I think these are both important changes um, that will have like a meaningful difference to, to the teams that, uh, and that we're going to have a, a whole nother day the dedicated to scrim so the average scrim count will you know increase right away i'm going to be personally pushing to go from like a five games a day uh schedule to a six games a day schedule where it's like a three games and a break and then three games what we were doing like, is basically yeah, five yeah. in a row straight and what was happening is players like weren't eating like until like uh until the five games were done so game four you just saw quality drop off and they were tired and they were hungry and grumpy and i don't like it my players don't like it so we're going to be really pushing to have a three games and a nice little break and another three games and that's going to result in you know uh you know from 18 you know 15 excuse me 15 games a week average to suddenly 24 like, you yeah, 24 and that's a massive increase on a percentage count so i th i think it's going to be really good for our region for those changes to happen yeah and to explain why the pro players didn't like it guys because you might think well why couldn't you scrim on the days that you're just playing one game well the problem is is that you know it takes a lot of time to get all the players together move them to the lcs studio get them into the warm-up room warm up wait for the last game or the wait for a couple games to end because they have to get there early then they have media obligations interviews blah 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 content with riot and so Basically, anytime they go to the LCS studio, they spend an entire day for one game, which is really inefficient if you want to get better. So that's why a yeah. lot of them were, were frustrated. Yeah, I, yeah. The, all of the you know the studying of the opposing team and the discussions about what they expect they're going to happen. These that's really time cons like consuming. And additionally, it's very there's like before you might think, well, oh, they could just do some scrimming before the game. The thing is, when you scrim, it's very emotionally taxing. Uh, each yep. review, the players are exhaustively talking about what happened. And so after like a set of three games, the, the guys wouldn't want to go on stage. They wouldn't be in the mentally, and especially if they had like a bad three games, they say they lost three games and then they wanted to go on stage. They're, they're not going to be mentally really fresh to go on stage. And then after stage, that's very emotional. Um, and trying to do scrims after that, they're exhausted. So it just didn't work. Like there was always like, yeah, we could try to do a couple of games on those days. It never worked out. Uh, so well, it's also it's also that preparing for three opponents a week is significantly <laughs> That's harder than yeah. preparing for two. Um, and no, you mm -hmm. know, no other region had to prepare for three opponents a week. And that will still happen sometimes with the super mm -hmm. weeks, which I still don't like. But it's Same. like you look at Korea and, and China and like they're playing a couple opponents a week, but they're playing them spread out on different days in best of threes. But the extra prep you have to do for a team either exhausts you or you're not as prepared for one opponent. And then you create mm -hmm. trap games where it's like, well, this this opponent should be easy, but maybe they're focusing on you. So they like snipe you. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you are focusing on the harder opponents. And it's just a mess, guys. It's just yeah. a mess. Like it's too yeah, many. The games. coaching was absolutely exhausted. Like, like Miffy was just like begging for, for LCS to change this program because it was so exhausting on him. Yeah. 
So I think it's good. Uh, one of the things that LCS said that I, I found quite um, interesting, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> let's put it that way, is that part of their announcement was they said they weren't going to change the format for a while, which which basically shut down conversations about best of threes. And also I found it interesting because they're hiring a commissioner, but the commissioner won't have the power to change the format because they've said they're not going to do it, which is curious for hmm. a new person coming in, I would say. Um, makes me kind of wonder what that job is. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, are, are you, are you sad not to see the best of threes? Um, uh, from a competitive level, I would love to see best of threes returned. I understand the concerns on broadcast around it. And I, um, I would even take best of twos over a best of one. Yeah, they run those in Academy. So, yeah. And, um, uh, and I, I would be all for that. I don't think best of threes are going to return just because of the the variability uh, and uh, broadcast constraints are on that. Um, but I would love to see it return. Uh, best of two also would love to see it return. But yeah, I'm, I'm sad those two things are a thing uh, and they don't seem to ever be a thing for the future. Um, you know, and I'm not really sure if it was a strategy out of LCS just to like say there will be no changes just so we could move on and talk about the other stuff. But I, I assume that anything is uh, up for discussion, really, you know, <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> OK, <laughs> mm -hmm. so maybe maybe they don't actually mean that is. is yeah, who knows? <laughs> I don't know what they mean by that. Because <laughs> I, I thought it was odd that they threw that in there because uh, yeah. they could have just said nothing. Um, yeah. I, I will so, say that they did listen. Like they did listen to our feedback um, and going away from three broadcast days was, was a big move. And I think they, they made some really good quality of life improvements uh, between last season and this season. So I'm really happy that they are listening. And I think that over time, we're, they're going to continue to tweak things to be better for us. What other quality of life improvements were you encouraged by? Uh, let's see. Um, if there's anything that comes to mind, because it's not nothing, there's nothing else that's coming to mind. Um, I know, and I can't remember what we talked about and what they and, and how they actually um, receive that feedback. Uh, but it, it's really encouraging that it's a discussion. It's not, uh, you know, in other leagues that are out there, like there is no discussion, there is no feedback session. They're like, here's this is how it's going to be, and they're, you know, and enjoy. Um, but I really do feel that Riot. Um, maybe more than ever has really been taking community and player uh, and coach feedback um, ser more seriously. And I, I, that's, I think, really reflected if you look at Valorant. They're, they've been very um, flexible and changing the, you know, based on what the, the fans are asking for in a positive way. So, um, yes, we're all hoping for double elimination at Worlds next year, just like they get in Valorant for some reason. God, that would be. I, 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 <laughs> Look, I, uh, that would be we, amazing. We, <laughs> Holy shit. But I, although maybe that's not good for me, I'm not quite sure. Sometimes I feel like, you know, but um, I, I, the, I, they do seem open to those type of discussions, which is pretty damn cool. Yeah, I, I'm hoping because at least, you know, now they have double elimination in many of the regional playoffs like, mm -hmm. you know, LEC and, and LCS and, and they have it in Valorant. So we know they yeah. know it exists now. Yeah. For a while, it was unclear whether they knew double elimination actually was an option, mm. but we know they know it's an option now. So hopefully yeah. we can see it at Worlds. That's and it's pretty cool. That's my big doing the Valorant, uh, you know, the Valorant skins um, for for that game and going towards their events. I mean, I feel like um, there's a lot of positive good stuff to talk about on what they're doing for us. So let's, before we get into questions, guys, and if you want to start asking questions in Twitch chat now, I'll start, uh, I'll start um, collecting those and finding the good ones. But before we do that, now that we have you here for the next couple of minutes, let's just speak briefly about maybe some other Cloud9 stuff that, that may be going sure. on. Um, so for example, like you guys have your Valorant rosters, you, you move from like a Korean roster and integrating some of the players into, into Valorant. So you've got that going on right now. You've been, you've been teasing some CSGO stuff on your, on your mm. Twitter. Um, you know, you moved away from rainbow six, um, but interestingly you had a Korean roster for rainbow six and now the Korean teams are doing really well in rainbow six. They used to be, yeah. you know, kind of bad, but we had a Korean team Dom one almost make the finals of the last major uh, that happened. Um, and also uh, the, obviously, you know, the, the pandemic and Korea being locked down, I'm sure made it very difficult to, to mm -hmm. run rosters out of Korea. Um, but what are you looking at as an org right now in terms of future rosters or games that you might be at least thinking about getting into or back into? 
Yeah, uh, Rainbow Six, CSGO, Dota 2 are always going to be things that I'm interested in. I would say a pretty, a, I'd place a pretty high priority on getting back into Counter-Strike at some point. Uh, I don't have plans for it though right now. Um, I do, I'm very concerned about like the state of NA CSGO right now. Um, and I feel like uh, COVID- Well, we'll talk on. about that soon privately. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yes, we will. Um, uh, but we, you know, uh, I, I, I love that game. Like it is, the spectator experience is still, I think, like top notch, best in esports. Um, and so, when the I major finally, did very well. Oh god, it was incredible, man! It was so exciting. I was watching that. I was just like, God damn! I need, I need to be in this game. It's so good. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I you know, I, I deal. I, I still have like real concerns about COVID um, and how it impacts Counter-Strike specifically and that it uh, it really does re require a lot of uh, your team to be in um, in Europe a good portion of the time to be playing at the top level. And yep. it's really difficult to have teams out there right now. Like, you know, we're seeing like Germany's really fighting COVID right now. And for me, when I got out, I was like, okay, I'll return when COVID's under control. It's not under control. Um, it's, you know, I've got, I've got my Valorant team in Germany right now and we're, you know, we're seeing like 60, 60,000 cases a day in, uh, in Germany. That's just like, it's not a good look. And for me, um, I, I want to see things stabilize there a bit before I really commit to getting back into that game that needs to have a lot of, like a lot of time in Europe. Cause I don't think I can support a team really well in Europe right now, um, because of that. So um, right now, like as an organization, very interested. If I see an easy path to make it happen, I'm going to do it. But I don't have like a solid plan to actually do it yet. Um, so some uh, some other games uh, that just came out, you guys picked up a, a Halo team that did very uh, well in the first Halo tournament. I was watching the finals of that. It was uh, kind of a, ch a choke. It was sad, but you know, they made it. <laughs> So what, oh what are your what are your God. thoughts on Halo Infinite? Because there's a lot of hype. The viewership. So we have a team like for about 50, a year 60, now. 000, uh, mm -hmm. 50, 60, 000 viewers on that. So it looks like a promising start to HCS. So hype. Oh, my God. That was so much fun. Like that event was incredible. That team that's been with us now for, I think, about a year. Um, but we built it for this game, uh, this release. And it just took a little while, a lot longer than we expected. Um, <clears throat> but now that we're here, I'm super hyped. Uh, I, I, I those, you know, it's an incredible team. Uh, we nearly won that event. I, it was definitely in our hands and we had some, uh, we gave it away. I would say, I think, oh, and then the giving it away is also like, they also like optic played incredibly well. Like some, I mean, there was, it was like a series of highlight, highlight reels going on. Those guys played super well. So, um, you know, I got to give it to, for optic, they, they, they came, they, fought so hard and they won. So uh, I'm really impressed with what they did. And, uh, but I think walking away from the event, like our Halo team looks like legit. Um, and so I'm really excited to be a part of that game. This, I mean, the skins that they came out with are absolutely incredible. Um, I feel like the, yeah. um, I, I, you know, I'm incredibly happy that I'm a part of that game right now. <laughs> All right, let's start asking some some questions of uh, from chat. So there's a lot of questions about uh, language barrier and how you're going to solve that uh, yeah. within the game when it comes to Summit and Berserker. And even though Winsome isn't starting, that that's another question is like, if you have Isles slotted as the starting support, presumably Winsome is the one who's actually bilingual. Um, mm. And so what is the, what's the plan for communication with this new roster? Yeah, I mean, that's important. Um, a lot of our players and staff are going to be working on their Korean. Um, and so it's, we're both going, we're going both ways Fair here. Enough. You know, we're going to work, we're going to try to meet in the middle here. Um, and we, we went out and got the, we, we feel the best translators in the business that are also challenger level league players. Um, and often that they are actually coaches of the game. Um, but it's really important when you bring in a translator that they can't just be completely fluent in English and completely fluent in Korean. They also need to be completely fluent in League of Legends. In the game. Yeah. Um, otherwise, they can't do their job effectively. So we we went out and found, you know, because these players are going to be up and down 
between Academy and LCS, we need to have one of these excellent translators that's a challenger level player in league as well, in both assigned to both teams um, to really help move communication along. Uh, so, you know, I've, this, thankfully, this isn't the first time I've done this. You know, we've actually done it several times. We've got Koreans and English play, uh, speakers like on our Valorant team. They've been obviously very successful with it. Um, we've done this on our League of, uh, League of Legends team historically. And the interesting thing is like, okay, if you look on the face of it, uh, you look at a review and you see someone speaking in English and then it being translated to Korean, then someone speaks in Korean and it's translated back to English. And you're like, wow, that's really inefficient. That's really slow. But what we've actually found to happen is in reviews, often someone will be talking and the other person is like thinking about a response before they actually listen to what's being said. Mm. In this kind of slower communication, it allows the players and the coaches uh, to actually think about what's being said during the translation and then form a response and then listen to the response and give like an actually more well thought out like communication pattern. So it's giving room for people to actually engage their brains and talk to each other on a better level versus, you know, sometimes you're talking over each other and you're actually not hearing each other. But the in when you have a translator involved, there basically has to be silence in between each thought. So if someone speaks out of thought, no one else can be talking. You have to pause. That has to <laughs> right. be translated. And then the response has to happen. And then that has to be translated. So there's built in pauses and silences in the communication. And yeah, it's slower, but I think that you're going to get the actual communication hap that happens. I think will be deeper and more meaningful. So we just need to make sure that we try to be as efficient as possible in the, in, in the way we speak, um, but really listen. Uh, and and uh, and form like really well thought out responses to, to so that the communication is is as effective as possible, and um, so it's tough. It is slower, but I think it could be better. Yeah, and I'm sure it'll just be a, a process of adjusting for the new players to NA and everything like that as well. And yeah. uh, you know, the nice thing, at least about most Korean players, is their English comprehension is pretty good, even if their speaking is not. And then as they get more practice, um, you know, yeah, it's yeah. it's like it's almost like more confidence in, in what yeah. they're saying is actually right, but they actually know what you're what they're saying. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that they're, that they're really comfortable. Um, there's going to be a, essentially an equal amount of Korean speakers to English speakers, and uh, and half of those people can translate pretty well. Um, so, and we're going to be having, we're bringing back Korean chefs. We've had, had this in the past and it's always yep. been, um, it's always been loved. Uh, the only reason we stopped is because of COVID um, concerns. Um, but now uh, in the past, we had like these three Korean, like basically moms that, you know, their kids have yep. gone off to college, um, yep. working it's in a very kitchen. very common in LA. Yeah, yeah. And it, oh my God, like the players absolutely. I mean, I remember it. the one at the Spitfire house was top two. Oh God, she, she came back to get her and great. show up. Incredible. <laughs> it, it's, it's great. It's like, there's almost like this empty nest thing has happened. Like these moms have sent all their kids off to school. So they want to have someone to take care of. And all of a sudden they get all these kids again. They're like, Ooh, they're, yeah. they're, they're having a good time. They see like, yo, yeah. Blabber, you didn't eat very much. You're like, you better eat this, you know? And, and so I don't have to chase it was, it was great. It was great. Food yeah. Was and awesome. so, yeah, it's actually, it's really, it's a, I think it, it's, and it makes the, the environment in the house really fun. And, 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 um, I think I think the players love the attention and the the chefs love the giving the attention. So I, I'm excited um, to to get back into that. Um, I, I'm sure I'll probably need to start working out more because generally the food's super good and I eat a lot more than <laughs> usual. But uh, I think it's worth it. So uh, here's a good question: uh, Do you have a, a a story about the funniest thing that happened behind the scenes at Worlds? Do you have any kind of fun anecdotes while you, while you were in Iceland? Hmm. God, I mean, I was I was so damn stressed because I knew Perks was leaving early. Like, I, and so <laughs> I wouldn't fair. say it may not have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a lot of fun um, because I was constantly like, and especially until like, because Perks told me, and and he didn't tell the rest of the guys for maybe a week. And there was that week where I was just like, oh my god, this is you know, I, I this thing I know what I can't share with anybody was so awful. Mm. And I, I uh, the moment we actually got out of uh, we got out of groups basically 
and, and me and Luca were talking and I'm like, Hey, Luca, what do you think about sharing with the rest of the guys? Like what we're, and I've actually seen some people actually talk negatively about this, but I think it was actually really good. I'm like, what do you think about just telling the rest of the guys that you're planning to not come back? Um, because we, you know, you can now tell them it's not because we did bad or anything like that. We're getting out of groups, but I feel like there's this unsaid tension. Cause I think everybody knew that he was really missing home. Um, mm. and, uh, and he's like, wow, I'm so glad you actually brought that up. Cause I wanted to ask you what you, th- what you thought about it, because it's for me, he's been, you know, kind of hiding this and it wasn't, it was eating him up. And, uh, so we actually told the guys that night and it was super well received. All the players were like, you know, just like, you know, I get it. That totally makes sense. Like I would do the same thing. This is our last dance. Let's go crush us together. That was, right, it was right. not one last ride. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't demotivational at all. Well, it relieves the stress in a way. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I can see it, it. it relieved a ton of stress on, on perks. It relieved, I think a lot of the players he kind of knew, um, to be honest, like, you know, uh, he was spending a lot of time talking to Carzy and Aspired and other players, you know, some <laughs> hot yeah. tub things yeah. going on. Yeah, the Blue Lagoon time. <laughs> a lot of lagoon runs and walks. <laughs> and the players are like, what's going on with this dude? What's he doing? You know, and so, um, uh, you know, it, it definitely relieved, like, I mean, they, they, to know that he's not there looking for your replacement. He's looking for his next place to land was, was right. I think, really good. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine some coach questions here real quick, which is uh, – I'm going to do a two-parter. What makes it so difficult to find a suitable head coach in League of Legends, number one? And do you have at least a timeline for for announcing a head coach? Yeah, so I have a contract that's waiting to be signed from our head coach. There you go. And I have been told it will be signed. And I hope to, for it to be signed, but announcement to happen within, within three to four days, uh, if there not sooner. Um, so that's the, that's the timeline. Um, and why it's so difficult is um, there are few, very few coaches that players actually think understand the game. Um, and when a player doesn't feel that the player that the coach understands the game, um, they just really have no respect for him and don't want to listen to him. So most of the coaches, I would say, in the game are in that category of not respected by the players. Uh, on top of that, you need a coach that not only knows the game really well, but needs to know how to motivate players and, and, and um, get players to talk about issues. So having someone who's not only really good at understanding the game, but also really good at understanding and reading people, that there's not very many people like that on the planet. And so it gets to be really tough to find those few folks who can do both of those things. Um, and I think most teams, like, they're satisfied if a coach can do one or the other. If they're able to, like, get players to talk to each other, but they don't really understand the game, <laughs> they check one of the boxes. This is do it. Well, um, or it's a, it's a variety of coaches. You have strategic coaches who are more knowledgeable at the game. And then the head coach, you know, at least right. in Korean esports, is often, like, the people manager, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's how a lot of teams do it is they, they split it up. So having someone who actually can do both is super rare. And I want both. Uh, you have both. <laughs> Jack wants both. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here if we have any other final questions. We're at the end of our hour, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but we will we will see if we have any other good ones real quick. Uh, why why did you pick up Malice for Academy? Is a, is an interesting one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, he's an incredible player. I know some of his like history is uh, might be a little questionable, but we think he's grown a lot as a person and what we need out of our Academy team is really good players that were a push our LCS team. And the idea is that our LCS team prefers to play our, our Academy team to learn to get better than any other LCS teams. If we can get to a point, that's like the goal. And if we can get to a point where that is actually a thing, I think it's going to open up a whole lot of avenues of training that no other teams, at least in, in here and in, in LCS, have been able to do. Um, so we feel that with bringing Malice to our team, we will have a much more competitive academy team and be one step closer to that goal. Excellent. Well, I, I think... That should do it uh, for us here on the nines presented by AT&T. 
Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Very insightful. I hope the the Cloud9 fans really appreciate the, the roster construction explanations because that was very lengthy, but well thought out. And people, are, I'm sure, are very excited for the boot camp. Uh, hopefully, people will see some streaming, I imagine, they'll, to get themselves hyped up uh, for the lock-in tournament, which will start in, in mid-January. Um, should be, you can check in chat right now for the Puma giveaway. So thanks to AT&T, Microsoft, Puma, all of you guys who who sponsor the show and who sponsor C9. And we'll be back sometime in the future. Stay tuned to the Cloud9 Twitter and we'll announce guests. And we'll see you then. Thanks, Monty.